Good morning. morning. Welcome to Thrive. It's good to have you here today. And um, we have started a series called Resolve. At the beginning of the year, when many people make resolutions to try to change, change is very difficult for any of us, honestly, right? It's also a series about resolving conflict, because there's a lot of conflicts, actually, in this world today. That little video ahead of time, AJ and I, when we put it together at FGCU, he was just writing down all sorts of things, right? And there's so many of them, we couldn't even exhaust the list by any means. And um, so the question today that we have about the global issues as well as the personal in our lives and how often we're in conflictual situations is do we really want to solve the conflict? Do we want to solve? Do we want to fight, or do we want to solve things? Do we like to throw blame around, or do we want to find a solution? It's a fundamental question. And I'll tell you, there are many times that I look at how this world is handling the differences that we have, and I have to go like, hmm, I have a feeling most people just want to fight. They don't want to solve anything. They just want to be right. They don't want to actually make progress. They just want to dominate. And that's a problem. That is a problem. So slowly but surely, we'll be working with resolving conflicts during these weeks in January. Um, those that we experience in our everyday relationships at work, home, in the classroom. <laughs> I've heard already numerous comments from students about my roommate is driving me crazy. <laughs> right? Um, but uh, we're going to try to get there, and we'll get to a gospel-centered, biblical perspective on how do we resolve questions. But today, we're asking the question simply, do we want to resolve conflicts, and how do we do it? And are we listening to people? Are we being influenced by people? Are we around the people? Are we, letting, are we following people who want to resolve conflicts? Amanda Ripley wrote a book. I would recommend it. It's a uh, a book called High Conflict, as she, over the last few years, and she's now working at trying to bring peacemaking and resolving conflicts worldwide, corporately, um, as well as just personally for people. Um, but in this book, she traveled around the country and worked with different people that found themselves in their good intentions, good intentions ending up in what she calls high conflicts, in the tar pits, stuck in a situation where it got so bad they didn't know how to get out of it, and everything that they did actually caused more. <laughs> OK? So today, we're going to be exploring all of this through Psalm 1 and see how this psalm, not randomly put at the beginning of the Psalter, the 150 psalms, this one starts out the entire Psalter to tell you what is the way to live, the methodology to read the rest of the psalms, as well as the model of how to live your lives and deal with conflict. But let's follow along. Let's read together now Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinner, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So we're going to be weaving together a number of passages to stay today as we start in Psalm 1 and use that kind of as the outline of our message. Um, people do get trapped into, you could call it the quicksand or the tar pits of conflict where every move they make, the ones that would naturally come to you just make it worse. Good intentioned people, like I said, as Amanda Ripley had studied, people who know that they're right on the subject, but somehow it just goes all wrong in resolving conflicts. So how do you do, how do you, well, you might be questioning right now, how do you know when you're in that kind of conflict? Because we all have it. Conflict's inevitable. 
but how do I know I'm in a high conflict? And here are some of the questions you might want to ask yourself. It's quite the long list. Do you lose sleep thinking about this conflict? Good. It's a good statement right there. If you're losing sleep over this conflict, you might be stuck in it. Do you feel good when something bad happens to the other person or side, even if it doesn't directly benefit you? There's a German term called schadenfreude. Have you ever heard of that? Schaden oh, that's so sad. But you're really happy <laughs> that it happened to them. Um, if the other side were to do something you actually agreed with, something small maybe, but would it feel very uncomfortable to acknowledge this out loud? Like, oh yeah, that was good. I don't want to tell them that. Does it feel like the other side is brainwashed like a cult member beyond the reach of moral reasoning? That might be a little projection there, by the way. Uh, do you ever feel stuck like your brain keeps spinning, ruminating over the same grievances over and over again without ever uncovering any new insights? When you talk about the conflict with people who agree with you, do you say the same things over and over again and leave the conversation feeling slightly worse than when you started talking? Has something you, someone who knows you very well told you they don't recognize you anymore? Do you ever find yourself defending your own side by pointing out that the other side does the same thing, but worse. Do you see different people on the other side as essentially interchangeable? If your conflict is just with one person, is it hard to conjure a visual of that person as a small child that once they once were, even if you try? Do you use words like always, good, bad, us, them, or war when you talk about this conflict? And do you find it hard to remember the last time you felt genuinely curious about the other side's thoughts, intentions, or actions? You might right now go like, ugh, ouch. I might be stuck in one, or I'm headed in that direction. And if it's not you, you don't have to look far to your neighborhood, to your HOA meeting, Oh, my goodness, right? Um, and if, you get, if your HOA is running smoothly, which I don't know of one down here, from what I hear, then you don't have to go too far until you see conflicts in your area. Or finally, especially, oh my goodness, are we in high conflict in our society? Politically, corporately, social media, whew, anti-social media. That's what's going on. So Psalm 1, I think, gives us, and we start with us. I'm not talking about them out there today. <laughs> By the way, that's a good formula for just creating a very self-righteous um, congregation. Okay, A self-righteous congregation that feels good about themselves and disdains people outside, and that's just another version of high conflict. So we're not going there. We're going to start with us. And Psalm 1, I think, gives us the right perspective. And the first point that we're making today is that you are not to, as Psalm 1 says, don't walk, sit, or stand. Those are the three words that are used in Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Don't walk in that way. Don't be around that. The word translated in the Hebrew for walk is actually the Hebrew word halach, and it means much more than ambulating next to someone. It really is the word that's used, halakha, in the Hebrew texts are used for your way of life. It's how you put into practice your theology. By the way, our um, student podcast that we're going to do, RJ, right? I'm sorry, Grace, you can't make it this time. The time isn't working. We do a student podcast each week, and we're changing the name to um, Theocology for the fact of what they've been trying to get me to do all the time last semester. We did the Wings Up podcast, and it was kind of, I was trying to just kind of talk about topics. Any topic we brought up, whether it was anxiety or uh, con they, they dove deep into theology, and so uh, we're going to be applying theology to life as a college student, and I think that's going to, it actually is resonating with these students at least, if not more, um, and that's exactly what 
the Bible talks about. Theology is not supposed to be this, this abstract stuff up in your head or flying out into space. It is a practical thing and the practical moves. So it's not just having an idea or an understanding, but it is the practical aspect of trusting God, walking, living a way that's consistent with him and his word in the gospel of Jesus Christ and being impacted by it on a regular basis. So that's why the Hebrew word halak comes again and again as the way that we are to live, okay? It's not just a bunch of doctrines. And we see that word halak in the Bible for right at the beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, we have Adam and Eve. What were they doing with God? They were walking with him. And it wasn't so much that they were just ambulating to get their, their move ring, you know, closed during the day and get their 30 minutes of exercise. And it was really about that they were being mentored by, that they were being uh, in fellowship with and relating to God as God chose to come among his own, Adam and Eve, and be with them as their mentor, lead, guide. I think that's why when Jesus calls his disciples in the New Testament, what does he say? Does he say, believe in me? Not right away. Does he say, think about me? No, he says, follow me. Notice in Matthew 4, 19, follow me. What happens when you follow me? You'll become fishers of men. That's what happens from following Jesus. Jesus is basically saying, walk with me, learn from me, model your life after me, trust me, listen to me. It's all in the idea of walking with God. It's all what our lives are to be like. And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Who am I walking with? Who am I allowing to influence me? Who am I following? Who is influencing me? What are my daily, regular, listening, reading, absorbing habits? Later in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus makes a general observation about the human condition and human life. He sees a giant crowd in front of him in Matthew chapter 9, and this is what he says. He has compassion on them. So that's his general view of humanity is this idea of compassion. He really feels deeply for you and me. And then he describes who we are. We're harassed and helpless. We just don't do well at taking care of ourselves at times, and we can't because why? We're sheep without a shepherd. Now I know, again and again, the Bible uses that metaphor of sheep. And I know I've seen too many memes and too many people push back, oh, we're, don't be a sheeple. Have you ever heard that word sheeple before? It's sheep people, you know. Don't just follow the herd. Don't, no, and I'm not a sheep. I'm a lion or I'm a bull or I'm, it's like, yeah, you won't find that in the Bible. <clears throat> people aren't bulls or lions. They might be beastly at times, and there are metaphors for that. But we're all sheep. And why I think Jesus, and why this is important is, you're, two things happen with sheep. They either follow someone or they wander. Those are your choices. You're either following someone or you're wandering. Well, I'm not following anybody. I'm doing my own thing. That's called wandering. That's called wandering. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So, again, whom are you following? How are your decisions reflecting whom you are following? Psalm 1 says the righteous does not walk with the counsel of the wicked. They're not taking advice from that. Or stand in the way of sinners, that is, hanging out with those who want to be breaking God's truth and law. Nor does, do they sit in the seat of scoffers, that is, well, you could translate it today to all the trolls and all the critics who all they want to do, and they make a living at it, maybe, by placing themselves in a superior position over others. It's so easy to be a critic of everything else. 
It's so easy to tear down and deconstruct. And when we do these things, when we hang out with people like this, what happens? What's really going on? It feeds my ego, by the way, to feel like, look at me. Those people over there are the terrible people. It's called self-righteousness again. It's the last thing any of us need. In fact, ironically, you can kind of, if you really meditate on God's word, I think, you see that the wicked that are described in the Psalm 1, first of all, the wicked were within Israel. It wasn't like those nations out there. So there are other people who are supposed to be within God's people. The wicked are the ones who think they are so righteous. They're self-righteous. The truly righteous in the Psalms and elsewhere are the ones that realize they don't have their act together and they trust in God. The know-it-alls don't know, and those who know they don't know it all are the ones who grow in wisdom. It's fascinating, isn't it? So Amanda Ripley advises us not to be around what she calls <clears throat> conflict entrepreneurs. I always, that word is just hard for me to say. On, it, cause it's spelled so weird, right? It's French. Entrepreneur, entrepreneur, how, do you, how are you supposed to say it? Do you know, Vicki? Entrepreneur? OK. What does that mean, a conflict entrepreneur? Someone who actually makes money off of it, or someone who gains power and influence, who wants to keep fighting, in fact, loves the conflict, who inflates the conflict, who exaggerates the conflict, who spins the conflict, and in so doing, gets you all upset and your underwear in a nice little wad about whatever, and at the same time, is benefiting from the fact that you're all upset. That's most TV pundits, by the way. That's three-fourths of all posts that are on X. And it's every celebrity politician that is out there. They're using it. And when you stand and hear it and see it and absorb it, Psalm 1 is saying, don't walk with them. Your life will be a lot better if you don't. Now, I'm not saying at the same time that there is no conflict in this world or there are no rights and wrongs. There are all over the place. It isn't about that. And I'm not telling you to lose your sense of conviction over anything, but just watch out about your righteous crusade and how easily that turns into a fight that doesn't serve anyone. Blessed is the one who does not walk, does not sit, does not stand in the counsel of the wicked or the scoffers. Psalm 1 goes on to say, but instead, you get to delight. Verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now, the Hebrew word, I looked at this because it's like, it's always kind of like bothered me. Delight. How do I delight in the law? What does delight mean? It's the Hebrew word, hephez, and it really means to desire that I want. And 1,600 years ago, a man named Augustine of Hippo, probably one of the most brilliant minds that has ever been on planet Earth, wrote a book called Confessions and another one called The City of God. And in it, he understood the human condition better than most people do at any time in any age. And in it, he says that human beings are really not rational creatures. We are not just thinking beings. We don't just do what we think. He says we are desiring creatures. We do what we love. And Psalm 1 says that's what the righteous does. He loves what God has to say, and his desires move him. And he loves, as this text says, the Torah that's the word for instruction here in the text, the law of God. I don't think the word law is always the best English translation because Torah, and I think, uh, Victor, you found out in the Hebrew Bible class in Lauren that Torah doesn't just mean commandments, rules. Not at all. In fact, if you read the Torah, the first five books of the Bible are called Torah. 
Most of it is narrative, storyline. Almost all of Genesis is just the story of how God works with people and how at the beginning God created Adam and then Eve and he created them in such a way that he wanted to live life to life, breath to breath, face to face with them and how they turned away from that. And yet God still pursued them, still called them, and still promised he would resolve the issue. And then the story continues throughout the Hebrew scriptures, throughout Genesis, until it gets to a person that through him, Abraham, God was going to make a blessing to the world and to all nations through raising up Abraham. And through him, his seed, his progeny would finally result in that. When you read that story, what you're really reading is the story of God's love for you and for me, despite the fallen and brokenness. And when you do get to the commandments in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and all, the storyline is actually God gives them the commandments and then immediately God's people break them. And then he gives them and they break them. And you see this pattern, which I can tell you is a pattern in my life. I think in yours too, right? You give me rules, I'll break them, Um, especially when I'm driving, (laughs) especially now in southwest Florida with all the extra cars on the road. And if I'm not breaking the rules, I am breaking other commandments inside of the car with the (laughs) language. So what you really get is a narrative in the five books of Moses or the Torah that push forward to a solution outside of those five books that is brought up actually time and again by people like Jacob and Moses and even Balaam that look forward to what God is going to do to solve the issue of how we keep breaking the rules and God wants us to light in his law. Seth Postel, who is a Jewish rabbi who became a follower of Jesus, put it this way. The purpose of the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy, is an historical narrative whose purpose is to lead Israel through the broken law and beyond, namely to the Messiah, who Moses assures his readers will come in the last days. When you are delighting in that story, because that's a story that takes your story, my broken story, my mess, and makes it into a message of God's grace and mercy. That's our story. When that happens, we start to love it. Timothy Keller says this way, we see people try to change through moralistic behaviorism. They find themselves repeatedly lapsing into sin. If rules don't actually work, if you tell people what to do, you could, how many times do you tell your children and of course they break it right away, right? But the gospel of God's grace doesn't try to bend a heart into a new pattern. It melts it and reforms it into a new shape. The gospel can produce a new joy, love, and gratitude. New inclinations of the heart that eat away at the deadly self-regard and self-concentration. Jesus summarizes, in a sense, the entire story of the Torah and the prophets and the writings to his day and says, in John 3, for God so loved the world. That's the story, that he gave his one and only son. And as he gave his one and only son, the anointed one, the Messiah, to take our place, we didn't love him back. We didn't even want him. Even though we needed everything that Jesus did, we rejected it to the point where we pushed him out of this world on a cross. He's nailed between two thieves. His life is destroyed to save ours. That is the story of God's love. That is the instruction God would have us know. And that love so costly, not costing him money, not costing him material things, costing his very life, the life of his son. That's what God did for you. That is what God did for you and wants for you. He is the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper. That is the light in the darkness. He became, Jesus became the Torah. He became the Torah, God's way in this world. And it's in him you find all your desires met. It is in him you get to delight. 
Here's a general rule of thumb. I think um, I'm learning this more the older I get. And sadly, I wish I would have known it about 50 years ago. Um, you become that which you behold. You become that which you bring into your life, you view, you absorb, you delight in. You become whom you walk with. You sit at the feet of Jesus. You sit at the feet and with others who are sitting at the feet of Jesus, and you will become that. You will become then in the way like Jesus. That's what results. And that's why Psalm 1 says, what results in delighting in the law of the Lord in the Torah, who is the fulfillment of that Jesus, it is that you will prosper. Our third point today. Now, let me make sure that we understand what that word prosper means, because in 21st century America, prosper often is turned into material wealth accumulation, right? And though the Hebrew word uh, tzalach um, does mean prosper, it really does mean succeed or advance. And the question is, in Psalm 1, what is success according to this psalm? And the psalm is saying, you will get what you delight in, Right? You will get what you delight in. If you delight in the Lord, you will get more of the Lord. And that's the goal, to draw you close to God, to walk in his ways, and to stand in his righteousness, and to sit in his presence as his disciple. You become whom you behold. You know, in the letter to the Galatian churches, Paul uh, shares that there are really two ways in this world. And... Uh, in Psalm 1, there are two ways, the way of the wicked and the way of the righteous. In the book of Proverbs, it's the way of the fool and the way of the wise. For Paul, he uses those categories, but he calls it the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. But it's the same thing. It's the same thing. And he, and he says in Galatians 5, I say, walk by the spirit. You won't gratify the desires of the flesh. And the works of the flesh, he goes, are obvious. And we can list them all, but they are things from sensuality to drunkenness to enmity to strife to anger to dissensions. Don't you see those things are being celebrated in our society right now? Dissensions, anger. It's almost as if the, that's what we're saying is the best thing. You keep getting that. You keep doing that. You will become that. But Paul says, walk by the Spirit. And what does the Spirit produce in your life? What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And all those words, love, joy, peace, that's Jesus. You become more like him. You will salach. You will advance as you behold him. You might say right now at this point, John, this is all great, but you know, let's go back to the beginning. When you ask those questions, I realize I'm really stuck in the tar pits. I'm in a conflict right now I don't know how to get out of. And everything I'm doing seems to make it worse. I get that. I found myself there. And that's when... But what's the remedy, John? How do, you, how do you get out of it? It's not to lecture yourself. <laughs> right? It's not to set up more rules. It's not to say, I'm not going to ever be around that person anymore. It's to absorb and to delight in the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact that, like Psalm 1 says, be like a tree planted by a stream of water so that even when things are dry around you, you've got a deeper source than all the conflicts around you, than all the issues around you. The deeper source of God's love and grace in Jesus Christ. What you need to hear, no matter how many years you have been a follower of Jesus and a Christian, and what I need to hear, no matter if I've been only a Christian for a week, or somebody who's not a Christian and just coming into the faith, or someone who's been around... 
We all need the grace of God. We all need to hear the gospel again and again. You cannot have too much of that. And that's why John Zoll writes, grace is the hope that seeks us out when we are at our worst. So even in the tar pits, Jesus comes to release you, to free you, to forgive you. It looks forward to the long, hard road ahead. Jesus is not going to leave you or ever forsake you. He's going to be with you no matter, even if you get into the midst of a mess. Grace is not worried even if everything falls apart and everything goes wrong. It is the love of God that does not let go. It brings good out of bad and it seeks hope where there is none. You can even have good things happen as a result of some bad conflicts because Jesus, when he comes in, he brings that light into that darkness and he can turn that around. Not only your life, but those who are, you're involved with. It may start with an apology. It might start with some humility. It might start with just showing compassion to those whom you disagree with. It's going to be that you're going to be in some way influenced by Jesus and a little like him. He goes, and grace always gives another chance. Grace waits. It stands when you have fallen. It leaves the door open. Grace stays awake for you when you can't keep your eyes open for another minute, even though you know you should. Jesus changes everything. So, there's too much self-righteousness in this world. That isn't righteous at all. It isn't. There are too many fear mongers, and there's too many conflict entrepreneurs. It's so easy for any of us to get sucked into that. Don't get caught up in that sticky, mucky mess. Rather, delight in God's story of love for you, and you will prosper in his ways. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you this day. Thank you um, for this psalm of wisdom. <laughs> Lord, you know how we haven't followed it how easily we've gotten riled up and caught up into all sorts of conflicts in this world right now. We see it evident, the works of the flesh all through our society and even in our lives, Lord God, forgive us, renew us, and lead us. We know, Lord Jesus, if we would say we are without sin in these areas, we would just be deceiving ourselves and the truth wouldn't be in us. But we confess right now, we confess to you all, and we lay it all before you right now. And you, O oh God, are faithful and just. You forgive our sins, and you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for this. We thank you that we can walk in your ways and delight in your will in our lives. All because, Jesus, you became the Torah for us. God's instruction, God's message to us, because of your love, your sacrifice, the costly gift, you free us, and we thank you, Lord. I pray, Lord, today as well, not just for these issues here, but you know how many people were not able to be here today because of sickness or illness. We lift up specifically the Henahans and the Husneys who are facing different illnesses, for, for uh, the Colts family, for um, Mackenzie as well, and anyone else facing uh, illness and difficulties, we pray your healing upon them. Draw them closer to you. We also pray, Lord, for this new semester that just began. I ask that you would bless uh, the students here as well as the rest on this campus. We thank you, Lord, for what you are doing. We ask, O oh Lord, that you'd be with our president, our newly installed president, Timmer, and her administration at FGCU. Thank you, Lord, for our involvement there. We pray that you would bless her and that uh, we can partner in different ways with FGCU in the coming days. We lift up to you, Lord, um, all the unknown, well, that are personally known right now. Each one here, Lord, with whatever burden, whatever need, whatever uh, petition, Lord, on their heart. We lift them all to you, knowing, Lord, we can cast all our anxieties on you because you care for us. You hear us. You never depart from us. You are, um, Jesus, you are the one who will never let us go. 
May we delight in your will and walk in your ways. The glory of your holy name. All these things we pray, dear Jesus, in your name. Amen.